good morning. Good to see you this morning. Let's jump right in. Okay, uh, I'm Jennifer. My husband and I uh, do most of the teaching here. We have other people that teach. Um, but this morning, I'm, I'm up. So let's, let's go to the Father in prayer. Lord, we love you and praise you, and we thank you for this day, and we thank you that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Holy Spirit, I thank you to bring light in the areas of our life that are in darkness, that we can see where you'd have us go and what you'd have us do. Lord, what, what you're calling us out, calling us higher. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you in advance. Amen. So uh, we'll start in Revelation 2, verse 8. So, well, to the church, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, right. So we talked last week about the letter to the church at Smyrna. In verse 10, he ends it with, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Okay, so that challenges some people's thoughts of where our hardships come from. You know, a lot of people say, well, whatever happens in this world is God. And if we're going to be good Christians, then we just need to suffer through. But Jesus actually told the church at Smyrna, he said, I tell you, the devil is the one that's going to put some of you in prison to test you and that you will suffer persecution for 10 days, but be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. So we have been in a series called Faith for God's Plan, and last week we talked about grit for God's plan. Our faith, our faith is our entry into the plan of God. God is working and moving and doing, but our faith is how we engage in that plan. But our grit is the overcoming factor when we're in battle. We're going to have to, it's going to require some grit. That means it's not going to be easy, okay? Our purpose today, today our message is called strategic intelligence. Strategic intelligence. Our purpose for today is to help us develop a strategy. We want to have a strategy that we can operate in overcoming faith. So I, I want it to be clear what a life of faith looks like. It is not a life where it just happens. If you're just going along and you live and you die and life just happened to you, that is not a life of faith. I want it to be clear to you that you can overcome because Jesus overcame for us. And I want you to know how to make Bible promises your reality. I think a lot of us come to the Bible and we see this gap between what we see and what we live a huge part of the calling of True North Church is to uh, close that gap. That's what we're here for, is to close that gap. That the promises in the Bible are for us, and we can live in them, and we can operate in them. And that is what we're here to do, is to find out how. Now, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that Satan can outwit us and take advantage of us unless we are aware of his schemes. Paul said, when he was writing to the Corinthian church, he said, we're aware of his schemes. He's not going to outwit us. But we have an enemy <laughs> That, that is trying to stop God's plan and purpose in our life. Last week, we talked about how to anchor our life. At the beginning of a trial, at the beginning, we're going to have hardships. At the beginning of a trial, the beginning of a hardship, the thing that you do to, to get started is you pray. We looked at the example of Esther. Remember when Esther and she told Mordecai, he said, tell all the people and I will get all my ladies in, that are inside the royal palace. You get all the people on the outside and we are going to fast and pray. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn to our almighty king and God. We're going to turn to him. That's our first thing to do is pray. And then we get into what we call the messy middle. In the messy middle... Listen, guys, this is where the battles are won and lost. This is where it's hard, is in the messy middle. All we can do, the Bible says, when you've done all to stand, stand. When you've done all you know to do, then stand, therefore. 
stand. And we looked at the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were being threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace. In fact, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we just want you to know our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to you or to your image. This is what faith looks like in the messy middle. That's where the song gets the line, he's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. They were thrown into the, the three were thrown into the fire and they looked in and they said, oh, there's, there's not, how many did we throw in? They found four in, in, in there. Today we're going to talk about the end. We said in the end, we have to know we win. And we're going to look at the example of Paul. If you haven't won yet, you're not at the end yet. John 16, Jesus speaking, preparing us for life, said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have trouble, Jesus said. That's the word for tribulation, and it means extreme stress or pressure. In this world, you're going to have trouble. He said, but in this world of trouble, you can have peace. You can have peace in the midst of trouble, because I've told you things so that you can have peace. He said, take heart. That literally means take courage. Take courage, because I have overcome the world. That, world. that word there in the Greek for world is cosmos, and cosmos is this system where the Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. It's talking about, it's not the earth. We know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But that word for cosmos there is talking about the world system that are part of this fallen world. And we can see that that is, the, is where Satan temporarily for a period of time is the God of this world. He, he has access and influence. This is where he can come against us. It's where Paul had so much hardship. And we see the areas that fall into this realm are things like politics, government, religion. And this is where uh, Paul had the attacks against him. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And that word overcome there is nikos, like where we get the word Nike. It means victory. It's a continuous abiding victory. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. I am overcoming the world. I will overcome the world. There's not going to be a moment in our life where Jesus is not our overcomer. 1 John 4, 4, if we could go there, please. 1 John 4, 4 says, you, dear children are from God. If you're born again, you're a child of God. He said, and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We have the greater one. So today, uh, we looked at Paul's hardships. I just want to remind you what they are as before we go forward. He faced rejection from some of his closest friends and by many of the churches in Asia. The very people he was sacrificing his life for, he, he, he faced rejection. He had been severely beaten several times. He had been shipwrecked several times. He had lived through perils in the city and in the wilderness and at sea. He did much traveling by foot. He walked all over that part of the world, thousands of miles. He had been in peril of robbers and heathens and spies posing as believers, people coming to him that he could not trust. He endured hunger and thirst and sleeplessness. God did not plan those hardships for Paul. Paul was not out of God's will because he experienced hardship. You and I are going to experience hardship. And it does not necessarily mean we're out of God's will. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it was God's plan for us. But nothing that Paul experienced ever prevented him from doing what he was sent to do. Paul was determined to finish the assignment heaven had given him. Today, we're going to talk about finishing, finishing our race. Paul is the example of the ending that we want. 
So today, we're going to start in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. Our example of what we want it to look like in the end. It's good to have the examples in front of us. Verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Now, to the Jews that uh, read this letter, they, it meant something to them, this drink offering. The drink offering was when they would take a measure of wine and they would pour, it was an offering before the Lord that they gave in the temple, and they would pour the wine on the fire. And it was, the scripture tells us it was a sweet and soothing aroma to the Lord. Do you remember last week when we talked about Smyrna? And Smyrna means sweet smelling. It comes from the word for myrrh, an embalming spice. We said Smyrna, they were the church. Jesus had no correction for them, but they suffered so much persecution. And Jesus prepared them for it. And he said, and you're going to get through it if you'll just stick through it. They were a sweet smelling before the Lord. And Paul said, my life is being poured out. Paul said, I was filled up with a call and a purpose and an assignment from God. And I'm already being poured out. He's like, what's in there to give out? This morning, I prepared for you all week long. I've been praying for you, every one of you. I've been praying for you. I've been praying over this service. I've been praying over what God would have us say today. I've been praying over this message. I've been filling up so that this morning I can pour out to you. What you do with it is your responsibility. My job was to come full. My job was to come pour out. Then you get to decide what you do with it. Paul said, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure from this world is at hand. And I will soon go free. Man, talk about freedom. The Apostle Paul, the life that he lived, when he gets to the other side, I don't know if anybody suffered in a whole lifetime like he did. He said, I'm about to go free. He said, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, the worthy and noble fight. This is the amplified version. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that great day. Not to me only but also to all of those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. The victor's crown of righteousness. Each one of us is equipped with a call and a purpose and an assignment and an anointing. We are not called to just live this life and just make it through uh, it, and get the best most we can get out of life. We are called with a purpose. We're called to be filled up so that we can pour out, give out. You have unique personality and gifts and talents. And then we're supposed to be growing in our knowledge of the Lord. And that's part of what we give out. I've, I've, been, I've been studying the word so I can share to help you, to help bridge that gap between the promises of God and the reality in your life. And then you take that forward, and you can tell people of the goodness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul said, not for me only, but also to those who have longed and loved, welcomed his appearing. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us. For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Paul lived with the awareness of this moment. His whole life had his eye on this moment. He said, but it's not just for me. This is not a special thing that apostles do. 
He says, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is for those who are born again. When we read in, um, in Revelation, even at the end of the letter to the church at Smyrna, you know, Jesus said, you don't have to fear the second death. There's a great white throne of judgment that if you haven't accepted Christ, you, you go before that throne. But if you've accepted Christ, you're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. So when you live only thinking for today, everything seems monumental. And that's why we have so much stress and so much anxiety and so much depression. Because when you live thinking only for today, everything seems monumental. But in reality... So much of what has served to hinder us from doing the call of God on our life. So much that has been served, has been served us just to disrupt our joy. This day won't matter. We'll suddenly have a different perspective. A different perspective. The only thing that will matter is what Jesus will say to us when we stand before him and look into his eyes. When we stand before him and look into his eyes, a whole lot of stuff is not going to matter. All right, so Paul had strategic intelligence. Man, he did it. So don't we want to see, well, what did he do? How did he get there? How did he get to the end and say, I've done it. I've poured out. i fought the good fight. i finished the I kept the faith. That's what we want to be, Right? That's what I want to be. That's where I want to be. So we need to look at Paul. And the Bible is so beautiful because we get to see so much of Paul's life. I want to give you five things this morning. And I bet one of them at least that the Holy Spirit will prick you and say, okay, here, here's where you need to focus. This is where you need to make some correction. Number one, Paul knew the Lord. Paul knew the Lord, and he placed the greatest value in life on knowing Jesus. Philippians 3.8 says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I consider everything else a surpassing, I consider everything else a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The Amplified goes on to say there, and a progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. First of all, you can know God like that. You might say, I didn't even know you could do that. You can know God. Our lives should be a daily progressive getting to know him more. You know, trust, sometimes people, they hear a promise of God and they're just like, you remember the man in the Bible who said, Lord, help me with my unbelief? I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Trust comes in knowing someone is trustworthy. Well, as you get to know the Lord, that will take care of your trust issues with him. You get to know him and you will find him trustworthy. You will find him true to his word. You will find his promises good. All right, so Paul knew the Lord, and it was so important to Paul that he prayed in the Ephesians for the Ephesians church and for us who would read later. He prayed that we would know him more because he knew we needed this. Number one, Paul knew the Lord. Number two, what did Paul do? Paul let it go and pushed ahead. Paul let it go and pushed ahead. Let's look at Philippians 3.13. We can see into the mind of, of, of this man that, that completed his call. He said, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Now, when you read this, does this give you the idea that if I just sit back and say everything that happens is God and whatever happens, happens, que sera, sera, is that the kind of life Paul was living? No. He said, I I press on to reach the end of the race. There is some effort on his part and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. 
Passion Translation there, I love how it, he says, however I do have one compelling focus, I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I love this. This made me think of um, a movie that's on, I think it's still on Netflix. We watched it a while back called True Spirit. Have any of you seen it? It's a true story about the youngest girl to circumnavigate the globe in a uh, boat, in a sailboat. And she went through some really hard storms. And she was 16, 16, and she was by herself. And she would have to go out in, in the storms and pull her masks down and, and things like that. And so she would hook, she had on, you know, her uh, harness. She would harness herself. She would hook herself and hook herself to the boat. Because in the middle of that storm, had she not hooked herself to the boat, she would have been separated from the boat. And she would not have made it around the world. But she harnessed herself to the boat so that she could climb and pull the mast down and do, do all the things that she had to do in the middle of the storm so that she stayed harnessed. I love how the Passion Translation says, instead, I, I fasten my heart to the future instead. I fasten my heart to the future. There are things in your past. There are things that you did and there are things that people did to you that you're going to need to let it go. You're never going to be and do what God's called you to do as long as you hold on to that. But when we fasten ourselves to the future, I fasten my heart to the future instead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. He's calling us. So one of the things we have to do is to let go of the past that means we have to walk in forgiveness to ourselves and to others. And that is something God does for our benefit. Let's look at Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, this is God speaking. I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions. Only God can blot out your transgressions. For my own sake, he said, and remembers your sins no more. He's a God who forgets the past. Psalm 103, 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love. So great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So sometimes we carry this bag of, of things that have happened to us or things that we did and the guilt and the shame, and we carry that as a, a heavy bag that we're trying to carry through life. And God is saying, oh, I really want to remove that. I want to remove that from you as far as the east is from the west, that you don't carry that anymore. So how do we forget our past? How do we, how do, we do that? 1 John 1, 8 says, if we boast that we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. And are strangers to the truth. But if we freely admit our sins, when his light uncovers them, he'll be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ. And he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we're talking about that gap between the promise and, and the reality of it in our life. You cannot uh, hold on to sin. You've got to let these things go. You've got to confess your sins before the Lord. Confession does not gain God's acceptance. Jesus gained our acceptance before the Lord. His finished works. But it's our confession that cleanses our conscience and removes every obstacle from communion with him. And there's no need to confess over and over. Because that would be ignoring the fact that the blood of Jesus cleanses us. So that's why we leave it in the past. And we leave it there. And we forget it. Because God said he forgot it. All of our sins were paid for. We can't do anything to remove them. But once we confess, God forgets our sins and so should we. When we dig up our past and dwell on those things, you're giving Satan access to your thought life. This, this thought's contrary to the truth of the word of God. 
You don't want to think contrary to the word of God. So in every instance, you have to, you have to say, what does the word say? As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he separated my transgression from me. So we have to think God's thoughts. And then I love how the, the Passion Translation said there, he says, when, but if we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them. One of the amazing things about God to me is he only holds us responsible for the light that we have. If you walk in the light that you have, he's pleased. If you walk, you can be like, well, I don't, I don't know as much as you know. So I'm sure I'm, I'm doing this wrong. No, all you have to do is walk in the light that you have. But then it's our job to grow and get more light. But as his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. Number one, Paul knew the Lord. He prayed that you and I would know him. Number two, Paul let it go. He let it go, pressed forward. Number three, Paul had grit. We talked about grit last week. Paul had endurance for hardships. He did not let his circumstances move him. Life is not a smooth path. Okay, life is not a smooth path. Let's look at Acts 20, 22. Paul said, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Come on, Paul didn't just endure hardship when he was in the middle of it. He forged straight into it. He said, I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit's prepared me. Remember the Holy Spirit prepared the church at Smyrna? Jesus said, the, Holy, the Father's given you the Holy Spirit. He'll show you things ahead. See, the Holy Spirit is there to help you know you, you got some hard times ahead, but you can get through it. The hardest things I've ever been through in my life, the Holy Spirit prepared me, gave me a heads up. And it helps, it helps to know this isn't God against me. The Holy Spirit prepared me for this. And he prepared me for it because he, he was letting me know I can get through this. I'm going to come out on the other side. What I'm going through, I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to get through it. So he said, I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. All right, so our faith doesn't remove challenges from our life. However, our faith in God gives us the ability to overcome those challenges. All right. Paul had grit. Number four, Paul chose joy. It was a choice. In the midst of of a life of bombardment of hardship paul chose joy paul wrote from prison in philippians philippians chapter 4 verse 4 he's talking to the philippian church they had some hardships coming their way and he said listen always be full of joy in the lord always be full of joy in the lord I'll say it again, rejoice. The King James says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Verse 5, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord's coming soon. He kept that in front of him. He kept that in front of the people he was writing to. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. I'm sitting here in prison. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Have you told the things you're worrying about? Have you told God what you need? Tell him what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. We want to understand. We want to talk through things. We, you know, we want to, all of this in this mental realm. But when we go to God, there's a supernatural supply. It's a piece that this up here doesn't understand. 
His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. His peace will guard your hearts. Our dog has to take, is it called next guard? To guard him from heartworms. Well, the, <laughs> the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. If you're having trouble there, there's a, there's a guard for that. There's a help for that. Paul always chose joy. Joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Number one, Paul knew the Lord. Number two, he let it go, pressed ahead. Number three, he had grit in the face of hardship. Number four, Paul chose joy. And number five, Paul knew his purpose. Acts 20, 24. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work. He's like, it's not even a work that I, you know, say, well, Lord, I gave it a good try. He's like, no, I'm going to finish this work. I'm going to finish the course. I'm going to finish strong. Unless I use my life for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul knew his purpose. He knew his assignment. And he got to the end of his life and he said, I poured it out. I poured it out. I've got nothing left in me. I finished my assignment. I did what I was sent to do. I said what I was sent to say. I endured the hardships in the meantime. As believers like Paul, we have assignments from the Lord Jesus. Spend some time with God. You get to know him. You will get to know your purpose. And if you're looking for a life of fulfillment, there's a whole lot of ways you're not going to be fulfilled. The only way that you're going to find your fulfillment, find your purpose, is in the assignment God's called you to do. And you know what? As we mature and as we grow and as, as we, our life goes through seasons and changes, you know, God's going to, uh, the, the, it might look different from season to season. That's why we have to stay sensitive to him. And Lord, what would you have me do in this season? What does it look like now? I loved reading the life of Amy Carmichael, and she started getting older. And, and in her letter, she started saying, I realize that it's time for me to pull back so that the next generation can start stepping up. And, and we're training them to step into the call that they have. She had that sensitivity to, to the, the call of God and how it would change as she got older. Sometimes we're tempted to get sidetracked and distracted by the problems of life. That is what they're there for. The, the problems of life, the difficulties, the tribulation, the persecution that you're going to suffer. The whole point is not just to aggravate you, but to stop the plan of God. That's the purpose in that. To stop the plan of God. Uh, I'm going to close with 2 Timothy 4, 7, but this is just a, a paraphrase from one Greek scholar that I love. All right, it says, a good fight, that's what I fought, my race. I ran it with all my might, never stopping until I knew I had reached the goal and finished it. The faith, I protected it, guarded it, watched over it with all my heart and strength. In spite of the assaults and attacks, I stayed true to my assignment. Let's stand to our feet. You know, when we stand before Jesus, all the challenges that we face, all of our worries, all the little things uh, will be forgotten and just one question will remain. Jesus will want to know, did you, did you do your assignment? 
Or did you get distracted and let the cares of life stop you from fulfilling your assignment? Today, I want you to determine. You know, if you've been off course, let's make a course adjustment. I want you to decide that when I get to the end, I'm going to look back and be like Paul and said, I kept the faith. I'm proud of the fight I fought. I'm proud of the race I've won and the faith I kept. I have no regrets. No regrets. Praise you, Lord. Let's go to the Father. Lord, we love you and praise you, Father God. <laughs> we thank you that you call us out. Lord, that you call us out, that life is, is more about living and dying. It's more about eating, more than eating and drinking. It's more than entertaining ourselves and, 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 and filling our boredom. Father God, that we have an assignment from heaven. And our assignment is to fill up and pour out. Our assignment is to fill up and pour out. Father God, I thank you for every person here. I thank you that they're precious in your sight and you know, you know what the years before have been. And Lord, you know the years ahead. You know the call and the plan and the purpose that you have on their life. Father God, I thank you that you have an anointing. Lord, you have a purpose, Lord, that no one else can fulfill like they can. No one else can do what you've called them to do. Lord, I just thank you for stirring up that desire. Lord, stirring up that awareness that, that how there's something on the other side. That we're going to stand before you. That we're going to look you in the eyes. And Lord, what we want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Father God. That what you've sent us to say and what you've sent us to do, uh, the Lord, that our faithfulness is not dependent on how people receive it. How people receive is between you and them. Our faithfulness is dependent on did we do what you told us to do? Did we say what you told us to say? Did we reach out and connect with those you told us to connect with? Those you told us to to call, spend time with, to share the good news of the gospel with, to share our life, to let them have a peek to what it looks like to serve God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If you'll just repeat after me this morning, we're going to say the sinner's prayer. Father, we thank you today for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We receive you, Jesus. We call you Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And put us on your path. Reveal what you have us do. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father God. Thank you, Lord.